everybody, and welcome to Books and Books. Uh, I'm Mitchell Kaplan. On behalf of all of us here at, at Books and Books, I want to welcome you to this really, really special event for us uh, here at the store. Uh, those of you in the room see the big lights. Uh, you know that we are live streaming this. We've been doing a number of live streamed events for uh, about a month or so. Uh, and you can go to booksandbooks.com and you can see some of the archived ones that we have as well. And for those of you out there in the internet land, um, uh, if you're watching this, it doesn't matter where you're from, you can uh, give us a call. You see the number that's up on the screen. And while this event is going on, if you're so moved, you can call us, and uh, James will be happy, I'm sure, to sign a copy of a book to you. Uh, just call us, and then we'll send it to you. Uh, not the book for free, but the shipping will be free. Uh, free shipping if you're watching this on the internet. Um, in any case, uh, it's very special for me personally also to welcome James here tonight. He's, uh, I'm a big fan of his, have been from uh, the day he wrote his uh, Color of Water and then I got to meet him and he even played with his band uh, in the uh, courtyard. And I have to say, uh, those of you, if you can remember this, go to jamesmcbride.com. He's probably got one of the best author websites I've ever seen. Uh, it's really a lot of fun just hanging out at his website, too. Um, but to introduce James, there's someone who literally needs no introduction, uh, but I'm going to try anyway, because uh, uh, I probably introduced him at least 200 times in my life in different ways. Uh, but this time I'm just going to say that this guy who's going to come up here is one of not only the funniest gentlemen I know, he's one of the most generous people I know, and one of the most big-hearted people I know. And his name is Dave Barry. Please welcome him. Uh, thank you. If you'll indulge me, I'm going to read a little bit of James McBride to introduce James McBride. This will sort of explain how I know him. Um, this is from James uh, James's essay in a book called Hard Listening, which was written. It's an ebook that was written um, by members of the the all author rock band, the Rock Bottom Remainders. This is the beginning of James's chapter. I was monkeying around at a writers' event sometime before 2000 when I came across Amy Tan and Isabel Allende. I don't remember the event, I don't remember the year, or even where it was. I just remember we were serving penance there, signing books. The only thing worse than doing that, by the way, is not being asked to do that. After all was said and done, books were signed, crowd gone home, and the room cleared out, Amy turned to me and said, I hear you play sax. You want to join our band? I didn't realize at the time Amy Tan is a softie. She'll give a stranger her last dime. She had apparently invited several best-selling writers who claimed to have musical skill into this band at times with disastrous results. I, don't know, I didn't know back then, in fact, I didn't, uh, excuse me, I didn't know that back then. In fact, I didn't know the remainders at all and had never heard of them. But I was a desperate man at the time. I was a full-time musician who'd recently become a full-time writer and I was starving to play. I would have played with the Ku Klux Klan marching band back then if they'd invited me. <laughs> Next thing I know, I was staring at the ugly mug of Steve King on a bus outside a hall in Washington, D.C., after the most horrible rehearsal I'd experienced in years. The band sounded absolutely horrific, like a cross between a warm engine trying to crank on a cold October morning and the gurgling sound my Uncle Walter used to make after he downed fi five rum and cokes. They stopped for any mistake, or worse, they'd make a mistake and drive to the end of the song anyway, carrying the mistake around their neck like a sandwich board, embracing it, caressing it, placing it on the ground and stomping on it, destroying it, decimating chords and harmonies, entire songs, slaying the dragon until the whole thing was, was over. Just pound the thing into dust until it disappears. Just kill it off, everything, the mistake, the song. Just turn up the volume, demand more reverb, and go. Afterwards, I staggered to a bus and was waiting to take us back to the hotel, fleeing to the back to lick my wounds. It was, I was one of the first aboard and stayed to myself in the back. After a few minutes, Steve and Warren Zevon climbed aboard. They bounced to the back and took the seat in front of me. Then Steve spun around and said, now you're in the band and there's no way out. <laughs> and next to him, Warren Zevon laughed. Thus began the wild and fun activity of my middle years. Um, that's how I met uh, James. I'm in the band also, and he's so <laughs> right. We suck so bad. Um, the idea of the band was that writers with musical talent would get together and raise money for charity, but none of us have any musical talent. That's the one, except 
Mr. McBride, um, who is by far the best musician in our band. He is, and one of the secrets of his greatness is he doesn't practice with us ever. Um, <laughs> typically, when we have a gig, we, we say, James here? I don't know. Was he coming? I don't know. He said he was coming. He's like, and sometimes he shows up someday, but when he does show up, he shows up while Roy Blunt Jr. is introducing the band, and we go, Roy, he's here, he's here, you know. And then James comes out with his sax, the coolest man in the room, and just plays absolutely amazingly. He's a great, great, I'm not going to go into all the, uh, his musical accolades, but he is a very accomplished musician, won many awards, composer and performer. He also writes amazingly well, as the world found out with uh, The Color of Water, which is James's memoir about being raised in the Brooklyn Housing Project as one of 12 children of his white Polish immigrant mother. Uh, that book was unbelievably well risked. That was an explosion uh, onto the literary scene. Uh, the critics loved it. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for two years. He's getting the same kind of acclaim for The Good Lord Bird. Um, I'm going to quote a little bit from the New York Times front of the book section, of the Sunday book section, book reviews. You, can't, you cannot get a better review than this. And they called it a brilliant romp of a novel about John Brown, narrated by a freed slave boy who passes as a girl. Written with the same flair for historical mining, musical, musicality of voice, and outsized characterization that made his memoir, The Color of Water, an instant classic. The Times calls him a modern day Mark Twain, evoking sheer glee with every page. And I agree with that, uh, except I would say Mark Twain could never play uh, saxophone <laughs> as well as James. So uh, give it up, please, for Mr. James McBride. You like me. You really like me. Uh, it's very nice to uh, very nice to uh, see all the wonderful white nice people here tonight, and I really feel that uh, it's just touching in my heart. And um, um, you know, my mother told me if you uh, chew gum and swallow it, your behind will close up. So I'm gonna just get rid of this. And so, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> I think the reason why I like Dave so much is he laughs at everything I do. <laughs> um, it's very nice to see so many young people here, so many, like, I, I see some middle school students here, and, oh, pardon, okay, pardon me. <laughs> yeah. you know, Excuse me, Dominic, so much. Um, and uh, it's just a real pleasure to, uh, to be back here at, at, at Books and Books. Mitch has always been very kind to me from the very beginning, and this is one of the, um, the great independent bookstores in America. And, and you should know that uh, one of the reasons uh, I'm standing here is because of independent bookstores like Books and Books. Independent bookstores are really the last line of defense, reason and defense in America. Um, where do young writers get their start? Places like this. Where do they get their support? Places like this. So, um, so please continue to support Books and Books. Please continue to support your independent bookstores. And if you're watching in the great internet, you know, internet, wherever you are in the you know, the iCloud, whatever, just, you know, send your money here. You don't have to buy this book, <laughs> but buy a book from, uh, from Books and Books uh, or, or your independent bookstore. <coughs> I'm going to read to you for about an hour and a half, and then when I'm done, <laughs> we'll, chew, you know, we'll have a quick test on it. And, um, I, <coughs> I don't really know how to introduce this book properly because it's so complicated, but you should know that it's very funny. This book is about John Brown, who was a um, he was a an abolitionist during world during the Civil War. Um, basically, he began basically his exploits really began the Civil War. In brief, uh, in the 1850s, when Kansas was being settled, there was some question about whether Kansas should be a free state or a slave state. And so, abolitionists and people from the Northeast, from Boston and New York and Philadelphia, were going to Kansas. To, uh, to settle the land because you could get free land. It was land claims. You'd just say, I want this land, and the government would give it to you. Uh, but people from Missouri and Southerners wanted slavery to continue in this free territory. And so a big war broke out. And the pro-slavers were crossing over the Missouri border and just basically kicking the duff out of the Yankees, just beating them all over the place because they wanted slavery to continue. John Brown got word of this, and he went to Kansas um, to... Uh, to help his sons. And 
brought a, a, a wagon load of, uh, brought some rifles and some broadswords, and when he got to Kansas, he got busy, and he became very notorious very quickly, fighting for the, the anti-slavery cause. John Brown was very, very religious, um, uh, profoundly religious, and he believed that God told him that he should conduct a war against slavery. Eventually, he uh, ended up taking his war away from Kansas to Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, which is now West Virginia, and attacking America's biggest arsenal, where 100,000 guns were made. Uh, he failed, but uh, in doing so, his attack on Harpers Ferry shocked America. It brought, it brought America to its, its, I wouldn't say it brought the country to its knees, but it, it inspired. He w before he was hung, John Brown was trapped and captured at Harpers Ferry. He spent six weeks in prison waiting to be, to be hung. And during that six weeks, he wrote letters to the newspaper, letters to editors, he wrote letters to the friends and so forth. And he did more with a pen in that six-week period than he ever did with a gun or a broadsword. And he really, really galvanized the abolitionist movement. And the country shortly after that tumbled into civil war. Um, I was trying to figure out a way to tell this story that was interesting and that wouldn't bore people to death, because I hate these books that are like, you know, boom, 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 boom. I mean, I'm, it's like a sleeping pill for me. Why, why? I don't know why, but I don't like those kinds of books. And so I, I, there must be at least 30 or 40 books about John Brown. I read most of them. And, and they're all very serious. I mean, he was a serious. And I just, I said, well, if I wanted to read a book about somebody like this, I'd want to read it to the end. I want it to be funny. So um, I wrote, this book is actually the memoir of a 111-year-old black man who's sitting around telling the story of what happened to him. It begins with a fire in uh, the forward. It begins with a fire in a church in Wilmington, and these papers are found beneath the pulpit of the preacher's pulpit. And the papers are discovered, and they have this wild story in them. And so this is basically the papers of a 111-year-old black man named Henry Shackelford, who, when he was 10 years old, was working in a tavern in Kansas Territory. And John Brown walks into the tavern, and, uh, because John Brown walks in in disguise. And, he's, and the thing goes bad, John Brown ends up, sh you know, his father, and this kid's father gets, ends up getting shot. John Brown grabs the kid, and because slaves in those days wore, you know, wild hair and they had potato sacks on, he thinks he's a girl. And so Henry, little Henry, he calls him Henrietta, and eventually he just calls him Onion. Little Onion tells his whole, it just plays through the whole panorama of John Brown's life from Kansas to Harpers Ferry as a young girl who's witnessing this because... John Brown believes he's a girl. Most people believe he's a girl. Oh, black women, though, know he's not a girl. And he, so he has a whole lot of trouble trying to figure out, you know, to keep playing this little business of being a girl. He meets Frederick Douglass, and Frederick Douglass comes on to him because he's kind of cute. And then, I mean, all this kind of... So it's, it's, it's historically accurate in the sense that the, the facts, that the, the, the depiction of events as they, they occurred is accurate, and most of what John Brown does in this book is accurate. But the character, Henry, Henrietta, Little Onion, is like the only black person to escape Harper's Ferry after the attack, and so he lives to tell the story. So that's how, that's how, that's how the book goes. And John Brown doesn't get hung in this book. You know, he, he gets captured, and that's, you know. I don't like books with bad, sad in personally. <laughs> I just don't want to read a book that has a real sad, that's just my own personal prejudice. That doesn't mean you shouldn't read a book that has a sad ending, but. I mean, you know, <coughs> that's one license. If you're, the, if you're the writer, you get to write the story, you know. So um, I'm going to read to you from the beginning of the book, um, just a couple of pages, uh, and, then, and then I'll chat a little more, and then I'll open the floor to editorials, questions, comments, and, and other, you know, and whatever else you want to talk about, you know. Uh, so this is um, chapter one. It's the chapter entitled, Meet the Lord. I was born a colored man, and don't you forget it but I lived as a colored woman for 17 years. My pa was a full-blooded full Negro out of Osawatomie in Kansas Territory, north of Fort Scott near Lawrence. Pa was a barber by trade, though that never gave him fullest satisfaction. Preaching the gospel was his main line. Pa didn't have a regular church like the type that don't allow nothing but bingo on Wednesday nights and women sitting around making paper doll cutouts. He saved souls one at a time, cutting hair at Dutch Henry's Tavern, which was tucked at a crossing on the California Trail that runs along the Kaw River in Kansas Territory. Pa ministered mostly to lowlifes, four flushes, slaveholders, and drunks who came along the Kansas Trail. He weren't a big man in size, but he dressed big. He favored a top hat, pants that drawed up around his ankles, 
high collar shirt, and heeled boots. Most of his clothing was junky found or items he stole off dead white folks on the prairie killed off from dropsy or aired out on account of some dispute or other. His shirt had bullet holes in it the size of quarters. His hat was two sizes too, too big. His trousers come from two different colored pairs sewn together in the middle where the arse met. His hair was nappy enough to strike a match on. Most women wouldn't go near him, including my ma, who closed her eyes in death, bringing me to this life. She was said to be a gentle, high yellow woman. Your ma was the only woman in this world man enough to hear my holy thoughts, Pa boasted, for I am a man of many parts. Whatever them parts was, they didn't add up to much. For all full up and dressed to the nines, complete with boots and three-inch top hat, Pa only come out to about four feet inches tall, and quite a bit of that was air. But what he lacked in size, Pa made up for with his voice. My Pa could out yell with his voice any white man who ever walked God's green earth bar none. He had a high, thin voice. When he talked, it sounded like he had a Jew's harp stuck down his throat, for he spoke in pops and bangs and such, which meant speaking with him was a two-for-one deal, being that he cleaned your face and spit-washed it for you at the same time. <laughs> Make that three-for-one when you consider his breath. His breath smelled like hog guts and sawdust, for he worked in a slaughterhouse for many years, so most colored folks avoided him generally. <clears throat> but white folks liked my pa fine. Many a night I seen my pa fill up on joy juice and leap atop the bar at Dutch Henry's, snipping his scissors and hollering through the smoke and gin, the Lord's coming. He's a coming to gnash out your teeth and tear out your hair, then fling himself into a crowd of the meanest, low-down, piss-drunk Missouri rebels you ever saw. And while they mostly clubbed him to the floor and kicked out his teeth, them white fellas didn't no more blame my pa for flinging himself at them in the name of the Holy Ghost than if a tornado was to come along and toss him across the room. For the spirit of the Redeemer who spilt his blood was serious business out on the prairie in them days. And your basic white pioneer weren't no stranger to the notion of hope. Most of them was fresh out of that commodity, having come west on a notion that hadn't worked out the way it was drawn up anyway. So anything that helped them out of bed to kill off Indians and not drop de dead from fever and rattlesnakes was a welcome change. It helped, too, that Pa made some of the best rot gut in Kansas Territory. Though he was a preacher, Pa weren't against a taste or three. And like as not, the same gunslingers who tore out his hair and knocked him cold would pick him up afterward and say, let's liquor. And the whole bunch of them would wander off and holler at the moon, drinking Pa's giddy softs. Pa was right proud of his friendship with the white race something he claimed he learned from the Bible. Son, he'd always say, always remember the book of Hezekiah, 12th chapter, 17th verse. Hold out thy glass to thy thirsty neighbor, Captain Ahab, and let him drinketh his fill. I was a grown man before I know there were no book of Hezekiah in the Bible, <laughs> nor was there any Captain Ahab. The fact is, Pa couldn't read a lick and only recited Bible verses he'd heard white folks tell him. Now, it's true there was a movement in town to hang my pa on account of his getting filled with the Holy Ghost and throwing himself at the flood of Westwood pioneers who stopped in to lay in supplies at Dutch Henry's, speculators, trappers, children's, merchants, Mormons, even white women. Them poor settlers had enough to worry about what with rattlers popping up from the floorboards and breech loaders that fired for nothing and building chimneys the wrong way that choked them to death without having to fret about a Negro, Negro flinging himself at them in the name of our great Redeemer who wore the crown. In fact, by the time I was 10 years old in 1856, there was open talk in town of blowing Pa's brains out. They would have done it, I think, had not a visitor come that spring and got the job done for him. Dutch Henry sat right near the Missouri border. It served as a kind of post office, courthouse, rumor mill, and gin house for Missouri rebels who came across the Kansas line to drink, throw cards, tell lies, frequent whores, and holler to the moon about niggers taking over the world and the white man's constitutional rights being thrown in the outhouse by the Yankees and so forth. I paid no attention to that talk, for my aim in, in them days was to shine shoes while my pa cut hair and shove as much Johnny cake and ale down my little red lane as possible. But come spring, Tut talking duchess circled around a certain murderous white scoundrel named Old John Brown, a Yank from back east who'd come to Kansas Territory to stir up trouble with his gang of sons called the Potawatomi Rifles. To hear them tell it, Old John Brown and his murderous sons planned to deaden every man, woman, and child on the prairie. Old John Brown stole horses. Old John Brown burned homesteads. Old John Brown raped women and hacked off heads. Old John Brown done this, and Old John Brown done that. And why, by God, by the time they was done with him, 
Old John Brown sounded like the most onerous, murderous, low-down son of a bitch you ever saw. And I resolved that if I was ever to run across him, why, by God, I would do him in myself, just on account of what he'd done or was going to do to the good white people I knowed. Well, not long after I decided them proclamations, an old, tottering Irishman teetered into Dutch Henry's and sat in Barber's chair. Weren't nothing special about him. There was a hundred prospecting prairie bums wandering around Kansas territory in them days looking for a lift west or a job rustling cattle. This drummer weren't nothing special. He was a stoop skinny fella, fresh off the prairie, smelling like buffalo dung, with a nervous twitch in his jaw and a chin full of ragged whiskers. His face had so many lines and wrinkles running between his mouth and his eyes that if you bundle them up, you can make them a canal. His thin lips was pulled back to a permanent frown. His coat, vest, pants, and string tie looked like mice had chewed on every corner of him, and his boots was altogether done in. His toes stuck clean through the toe points. He was a sorry-looking package altogether, even by prairie standards. But he was white, so when he sat in Pa's, pa Pa's chair for a haircut and a shave, Pa put a bib on him and went to work. As usual, Pa worked the top end, and I'd done the bottom, shining his boots, which in this case was more toes than leather. After a few minutes, the Irishman glanced around and seeing as nobody was standing too close, said to Pa quietly, you a Bible man? Well, Pa was a lunatic when it came to God and that perked him right up. He said, why boss, I surely is. I know all kinds of Bible verses. The old coot smiled. I can't say it was a real smile for his face was so stern it weren't capable of smiling, but his lips kind of widened out. The mention of the Lord clearly pleased him. And it should have, for he was running on the Lord's grace right then and there. For that was the murderer, of old John Brown himself, the scourge of Kansas Territory, sitting right there in Dutch's Tavern with a $1,500 reward on his head and half the population in Kansas Territory aiming to put a charge in him. So. <laughs> I'm crying. I'm crying. I'm actually crying. No. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, thank you for applauding. I'm I'm <laughs> glad to hear it. Um, that book begins that way. Uh, the thing goes bad. Uh, Dutch Henry comes back. John Brown reaches for his heater. Dutch reaches for his. They drop the hammer on the guns, and the thing just goes afoul. And John Brown grabs his kid, thinking he's a girl, and scoots out. And thus begins the journey. It's just a long ride, where this kid is watching this man who preaches all the time, stops in the middle of the day, and preaches until the food gets cold and the the outhouse gets full and, and the enemy's just about to ride in and then he just says, let's go, man, and off they go. Um, it was a, uh, I, I came upon this story because I was doing a, my previous novel. Um, I was researching in uh, Fredericksburg, Maryland and I, I saw a reference to John Brown in this historical society and just decided to ride down the Harpers Ferry to take a look. And after I, I got there, I, just w I was fascinated with what I saw. Um, and I just became, just, I just became obsessed with the man, and I, I really had to figure out a way to tell his story in a way that was interesting, and in a way that would would tell readers American history without making them feel bad about it. Slavery is a hard thing to write about, because once you get past, you have to get past the, the violence of it and the the cruelty of it, and then you start to realize that it's a that it, slavery was a web of very very complicated relationships, and. Um, when you start to understand that, it makes it a lot easier for you to write about it. Um, so um, that's pretty much uh, my prepared remarks, which are ba basically not prepared at all. Um, and if you have any questions, if you you know uh, pose them to me, I'll be happy to uh, answer them. Any questions? <coughs> Stand up. Hi, I really enjoyed the novel. Um, I'm at, I teach at Florida Atlantic University, and I'm here with my graduate class. So my question is in some ways going to be tied to thematic concerns of the class for them. Okay. Um, the class is contemporary African American literature, the post-soul aesthetic. Um, and we, we're reading your, uh, your novel. We're talking about it next week. And then in a few weeks, we're reading Matt Johnson's Pym. So a few of these kind of contemporary, I don't know if you'd call it a neo-slave narrative, but novels that are talking about slavery. Um, and I was wondering if, I think it was, I'm not sure the year, but um, in 2004, writer Charles Johnson made a comment about um, that African-American writers 
uh, need not write about slavery anymore, that there are um, uh, other topics and uh, more contemporary topics that, um, that writers can kind of focus on. Um, yet there's been, I would argue, this maybe not a trend, maybe it's never stopped, um, but artists kind of continuing to talk about slavery, like in Toni Morrison's uh, recent novel, um, Song Yet Song, your, your novel before this one, um, Matt Johnson's Pym, I, um, some, uh, you know, Dave Chappelle, who's a uh, comedic work, talks about slavery a lot. So I'm, I'm getting my question. So my question is, <laughs> sorry about this, this is my long roundabout way of asking my question, which is, um, do you see your work, I'm thinking in particular your last two novels, or your work in connection with um, some of the authors, other authors I just mentioned, as in any way a commentary on um, our kind of current historical moment, like post-Obama moment, like the fact that um, we're still talking about slavery, uh, albeit in some perhaps new ways? Well, um I, I think I, I, mean, I don't I don't write based off the headlines. I mean, I, I think that's a, it's a very good question. Um, I, I don't really pay attention to what other writers are writing. I think, though, that <coughs> your question is very pertinent in the sense that young people now have fewer issues about race than my generation. Um, young African Americans and Asians and Latinos and whites are increasingly more sophisticated about the subject of race. And that pro that's something that, that, that certainly is partly a function of the president being uh, you know, an African American. Um, and so um, I'm, I like to think that people are more, young people are more accepting of these kinds of stories because they're removed from the brutality of it. Um, older black Americans um, are, not, are likely not to be that attracted to stories about slavery because they remember their great-grandmother telling them stories about the brutality they might have experienced, most likely experienced during the Reconstruction era, era and so forth. But I think we have reached the point in, Ameri in sort of an American issue we can actually talk about these things with some sense of sophistication. Um, and, you know, hopefully black writers will be read when they write about these things. I mean, I look forward to the day when black writers are just writers. Um, you know, most of my books still end up in the African-American section or even the you know I mean I don't care I mean, people are buying them so I don't care whether you know <laughs> you can put me in the Negro section I mean, you buying the book I couldn't care less I really it doesn't matter to me at all but um, <coughs> I think that I you you won't see many black writers writing the equivalent of Fiddler on the Roof and getting produced on Broadway it's just a fact it's just that's just how it is because it's a small club that said, you won't see many white writers from uh, you know, Fort Lauderdale getting produced on Broadway either because it's just a tight club. To get into that club, you have to have, there's all kinds of pedigrees you have to do to be to get into the club to get a fiddler on the roof type play produced on Broadway. In publishing, you have the chance, well, less, less and less, but you still have the chance of a place like the Books, books and Books in an independent bookstore seeing your book and handing it and, and making, it go, making it go over. Because once books like this, like this one and other books that talk about slavery in ways that are palatable and ways that are literary, reach an audience, people like these stories. Because slavery, the good books about slavery, and Charles Johnson wrote a really good book about slavery, Middle Passage, that was an excellent book. The good books about slavery don't, don't have these stereotypical images of like the white master whipping the slave and the slave always doing what the white folks said because it didn't really work like that. I mean, a crude example would be like, how do you handle your gardener when, you know, he, you know he's a drunk, but he cuts the grass good? You know the guy's a drunk, but he's cheap and he cuts the grass good. And you want to fire him, but if you fire him, you know, then his wife's not going to come clean your house. Or if you fire him, you know, then you got to get somebody else who might be more expensive. But, you know, this guy, he, he does the job, and you're kind of dependent on him because you're out of town a lot, and you have these relationships with people who are your subservient people. And during slavery, masters were, most white people didn't own hundreds of slaves. They owned one or two or a family of three. And they were very dependent on their slaves because if the, if the harvest time came, the slaves decided they were to work or they were sick or something like that, well... No harvest time. You know, you had a certain time period where you can harvest your plants. If you didn't harvest your vegetables, that was it. They'd go bad. You had to pick them, and you had to do these things. So white owners 
were dependent on their slaves. And um, that web of relationships has never really been fully explored in literature. I mean, it, it, for years it was, it was the gone with the wind you know, myth where, you know, all the white women walked around in petticoats and none of them chewed tobacco and all the men looked like Clark Abel. You know, they said Clark Abel had a thing where his breath was so bad the actresses didn't want to kiss him. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just heard that. I just threw my, I blew my mind. I hurt my feelings. I was like, wow. I cannot imagine him with bad breath. <laughs> but anyway, wh what was I saying now? <laughs> about slaves. Anyway, I think it's a different audience now. And I think it, there, the, there is now, uh, you know, we, ha we are a little more sophisticated about talking about these things. Um, and it's, it's helpful. And I think that one of the things about slavery that helps us understand, it, it helps us understand our relationships with each other now. That's why books about novels and nonfiction books about slavery are very important. The reason why my last two books are about slavery is because every time you, you pick up a book about slavery, a history book, and you read it, there's like a novel in every page. I mean, it's just incredible, the stories that exist. I mean, you know, if, if Dave Barry and his wife owned me, okay, just, uh, just assume they own me. I, I'd be the, first of all, I'd be the laziest slave in Florida. Because you know, they'd be my slave. I'd be like, pick, that, pick my head up. All right, well, you. No, but assuming that I'm working on the Underground Railroad, and you and this young lady next to you are not working on the Underground Railroad, but she, oh, I owe her some money. And you say, and you know that I'm married to your friend here. You both know that. And, I, and you find out that she's on the other, and you figure that I probably am too. And then you go tell Dave's wife, who happens not to be working on the Underground Railroad, because you make the mistake of assuming both of them are running. Now, now she blabs on everybody. She and I get sold. He divorces her, and he's broke. The web of relationships that existed during that time because of the economic business of slavery was really, really complicated. And so it's great stuff for novel writing once you get beyond the stereotypical thing of, you know, people being whipped and carried on. Yes, you have a? So I have a follow-up to that question. Um, <clears throat> as you were reading, I kept thinking of Alice Randall's The Wind Ungone, um, which is her writing of Gone with the Wind and the humor in it a lot of people had issue with it. And, um, in fact, they went to court to try to block the publication of it because it so drastically rewrote on with the wind in some very problematic ways where, you know, lots of conflict. How does, what is it about using humor? I mean, how does humor work as not simply a way of sort of making slavery more palatable, but, um, getting at those complexities? I mean, because well, the story's I mean, been told before, but well, first why of all, humor? Well, I mean, I don't know. I just, you have to, you have to, that's my nature. Whatever, whatever pain, I, I just laugh. At it. That's just my nature. I don't hold on to pain like that. So it's just my personal nature. If something bothers me, I just laugh. I mean, the best revenge is just doing good and forgetting all about it. That's just my own personal, like, two cent, you know, drugstore approach to bad things. I wouldn't have, I mean, the Wind Done Gone is not a book that I, I, I read, and it would, I would not, with all due respect to the writer, I would not encourage young people to write a book like that. I'd say, why try to rewrite what a, a white writer did? You're not going to change the fact that people love going with the wind. Just write something different. I mean, I, I, don't, I think the discourse, that kind of discourse for me personally, doesn't work. Now, it worked for that writer and, and presumably for the thousands of readers who, enjoyed, who read and enjoyed her book. But I would tell young writers of, of any color that the best thing you can do is to try to do something original. And the best way to do that is to try not to be cynical about what you think people think about you. Because if you are a cynicist, if you're a cynical person, you won't write great books. That's just my own personal opinion. And to rewrite a novel that someone else did to say, this is how black folks see it, that's really not the, that's not really the way I approach my work. Because first of all, the black community is, pretty, is a pretty trusting, enthusiastic place. Once you get behind the whole, the, you know, the bullshit of the Sprite commercials and the hip hop, we got, you know, all that crap. It's a really trusting, open community. And it used to be seen that way and saw itself that way much more when I was a boy than now. That's why when I was a boy, you would actually see people like old black cats who walked around who would talk like this and they were interesting and they would 
give you their last dime just, you know, because they were chewing snuff. And it was just a world that was just wonderful. And now, <clears throat> you know, you have black men walking around, you know, dressed like boys with, it's, you know, swallowing this, this you know, the worst aspects of what was once a great hip-hop culture and claiming that, that they're men as a result of that. When, in fact, there is enslaved, in some cases, even more slaves, so it's in some of the people you read about in this book. So I, I, wouldn't, I, don't, I just don't think it's, it's necessary. I think it's, it's, uh, it's not wise to waste time. To, it would be, that would be like writing about, you know, a, a uh, I don't know, I, I, I guess a crude, the crudest example would be to write about a, a, a turncoat who was serving time in a book and wall prison camp during the, the Holocaust. Well, we knew there were turncoats, but unless there's something that we can really learn from what this, you know, this vapid creature did, I don't see the point in writing a book about that, as personally. I'd see a point in writing a book about someone who showed courage and resolve and at some point turned their life around and was a turncoat today and then the next day sacrificed something great so they could do a great thing. But you have to write, I think if you're going to sit down and put yourself through the pain of this, then you have to write, you have to look toward the good in people. You're asking someone to pay 27 or $28 to, to, to be absorbed in a world where, where, they, where when they're done, they want to get up and you know, grab their car keys and go out and, and you know, go, go, get, go get a tuna fish sandwich and feel good about it. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> oh, good afternoon. Thank you Hi. so much for reading for us today. All right. um, I have a plot question in terms of the book. Um, I don't want to spoil any, any important plot points, but you did read um, in your excerpt, you mentioned that um, Henry slash Henrietta slash Onion uh, cross-dressed for 17 years. Um, and the breadth of the book doesn't cover 17 years. So he continued the implication there that he continued cross-dressing. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, is there any is other? Part de? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. I, you, you know, you never can tell the same joke twice. Uh, I, I probably, I mean, I love this character. And this book really was actually probably, other than The Color of Water, this was one of the, the most, uh, this book was a bomb for me. I mean, The Color of Water release gave me freedom. And this book gave me peace. Because I, when I wrote this book, I was in the middle of a, a really, really terrible divorce. And so it was easy for me to just like dip into Henry's world and just be free. You know, just, just float and just watch this guy go through this stuff. And it was really, really wonderful. But, I mean, to go back and, you know, I don't think I could do that. That would be like writing The Color of Water Part 2. You know, many people say, why don't you write another Color of Water? Well, you know, what's there to say? I mean, there's nothing else to say. I said all that, you know, I said I shot my wide the first time. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> what do you want to wake up and do it? I, I can't do it. It's over. But, you know... Um, for those of you that didn't know, my mother passed away in uh, January of 2010, and uh, you know I dedicated this book to her because she loved a good she loved a good whopper, you know she loved a good tall tale, um, and uh, and my niece died a couple weeks later, so I dedicated it to her as well. But I would think that, and answer your question, I I don't think I'm going to do a, another like Onion goes and meets Abraham Lincoln and you know <laughs> and cuts his hair and you know. <laughs> It's just too hard to stitch this kind of stuff together. You know, when you're in the Wild West and you're on the prairie, anything goes. Like there was, a, for example, there was a, a Wells Fargo. This is true. There was a Wells Fargo coach driver. She's mentioned in this book, I believe, who drove a, wag, drove a Wells Fargo wagon for years as a man. And nobody knew it. I always wonder, how, like, how does someone like this do a number one <laughs> when you're with another guy? Just want to know, don't want to get too, you know, I know it's too much information, but how do you do that when you're on the prairie, you know, two guys, you go, ah, all right, hold on, hold, oh, now wait. <laughs> I don't know, I guess, you know, I guess, I guess she worked it out some kind of way. Hello. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask, what do you think of like all of the younger people that are in like high school and like in some cases middle school reading like your book? Call of Water. Mm -hmm. Well, um, well, what do I think of the young people in high school and middle school reading The Call of Water? 
I mean, I just that just flips me out. It makes me want to reach for a joint and just cool out. You know? <laughs> no, I mean, I don't, I don't smoke weed anymore. I haven't smoked a joint. God hears it. I haven't smoked a joint in 30 years. I'm just telling you the truth. I, I don't. I don't like how it makes me feel. <laughs> um, I think it's. I, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I, you know, I, it's. Uh, I, you know, I'm a little. I'm. I'm puzzled by it. Actually, I think it's great. Um, you know what it is? Issues of identity really power young people's lives, <clears throat> and issues of, of identity are things that really power stories. And young people. Are, in this country, all over the world, are always looking to find out who they are. And that's what The Color of Water is about. It's about two people, really. It's about myself and my mother, and both of us coming into a sense of identity that converges at the end so that we, you know, we are closer. Um, and this book does the same thing. It's really about a little boy who decides at some point he's got to be a, a, a boy. He's got to stop being a girl, and he's got to be a boy. And only when he becomes a boy does he really want to be free. Like he's freed at the beginning of the book, but he doesn't want to be free because he was living good before. But then when he comes into his self and he realizes who he truly is, then he really, that, that, that makes him want to be free. So I think The Color of Water is, you know, being read by so many young people, it's been wonderful. It's been a privilege. I get letters every week. I get letters from kids all over the place. You know, I try to answer each of them personally. It takes a while, but it, it's a great privilege to know and my mother was delighted by it. She was, she, she was tickled to death by it. She just, she kind of had this approach like, you know, boy, if they only knew, you know, but <laughs> you know, she, she went with it, you know. After the weed story, it's going to be banned in school districts across <laughs> the, the country. <laughs> but we won't, we'll, we won't go there. You got a question? No, no, you do, because do? it's online for the online. What was the process like for you to get The Color of Water published? Um, the process of getting Color, color Water, well, The Color of Water was, was turned down by, you know, m several publishers. Shall I name them? I shall not, you know. But it was, it was turned down by a lot of publishers and then uh, 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 an editor named Cindy Spiegel saw it at Riverhead and she said, this is good. Well, what I did was I put my mother's story together first and she said, this is good, you know. But you have to, you know, like I was willing to trot her out, but you know. So she said, you have to put your story in here too. So I created, I just wrote my story between the chapter breaks of my mother's story. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, uh, it, it, was, it was just, uh, I should mention when The Color of Water came out, it was, it was, it was, it came out like with a lot, it was like even reviewed with a couple of these like tragic mulatto books, like, I'm a mulatto, ah, you know, <laughs> chicken or bagel, dog, what should I do? You know, and uh, <laughs> I just found that to be like, T totally offensive because my family was happy I mean we were like we, you know we were considered weird by some people but most people in my community my mother was really respected she was liked by most black women in my community because she was like she took care of business her kids went to church and she was private she didn't bother anybody and you know we were pretty I mean we were all you know not really rich you know we weren't like super poor but we weren't like you know we were one of the like not so rich people but she was re respected by, by uh, black women in, in, in my neighborhood because they wanted the same thing for their kids that, that uh, white women wanted. You know, they wanted the kids to do well and, you know, and so forth. So I should say this, though, because I get a lot of letters about this, the kids who grow up mixed now. It's a little bit different. When I grew up, you know, we went to church. We were like, our mother really had no choice but to steep us in the black culture because America was more segregated than, and New York was more segregated than at that time. Segregated not by just race, but by, by economics, by class. And so all of the good things that came out of African-American life were, were fused into my family and fused into our spirit. So we didn't really miss, we didn't know what we were missing in terms of our Jewish life until we were grown. We didn't really understand what it meant to be Jewish, and we're not going to have that conversation here today. <laughs> but we didn't understand what, what Judaism really meant. I mean, Judaism... And this is the, all I'm going to say about it. I'm going to go move forward. But Judaism is really a, a religion that requires you to give. It's a religion that demands that you share what you have. Ironically, Jews are considered, you know, the stereotype of Jews is that they're cheap, stingy people. When in fact their religion and their whole culture and their whole community and their community involvement and their community history in, in America is that of a community that has given and given enormously to the larger society. 
we didn't know anything about that like when we were kids. You know, we just went to school and we, you know, we got Yom Kippur we had off, Rosh Hashanah, you know, and that was cool, you know. And only later when, when mommy was old did we realize what we had missed. And some of us have, you know, found some, some joy in it and some, some of my siblings have not. Uh, my mother's sister died recently. Um, uh, she did not live far from here. Uh, and, uh, and I went to the funeral, and it was very sad. It was very powerful, and it was very sad. And she was the last of, of that particular family. My mother's brother died in World War II, their mommy died, and her sister died. They were, they were all 88. They, both of them were 88 when they died. So. But look, you have to live. If you're going to spend your life worrying about you're not going to befriend somebody, you don't like someone because they're Islamic, or they're Jewish, or they're Latino, or they're Chinese, and there's something wrong with them, Go ahead, because when you get to an old folks' home, if you make it that far, <laughs> you will find that they ain't worrying about that. They're, they're happy that the kidneys are pumping, the lungs are still wheezing, and they... So, you know, you only have 80,000, 30,000 days if you live to be 80. So how do you want to spend those 30... You want to spend those days thinking about, you know, something wrong that somebody, something wrong that somebody did to you, or do you want to... How do you want to do it? I know how I'm going to spend mine. And that was a gift that, you know, that my mother gave to me, and... You know, and I hope to, you know, I hope you walk away with some of it here today. No. Another, another question? No more questions? I think there are, but I think people are shy. There's a question over there. Um, in your life uh, as a writer, um, what is the, what would you say is the uh, proudest thing that you've you know the one thing that you're really proud that you did. Well, I should I should I should mention the young man who asked that question is one of my former students from NYU. His name is Melvin Felix, a very talented writer, uh, who lives here and works for the Fort Lauderdale newspaper, and that's why he has the guts to ask me that kind of question. <laughs> you know, I'm. I've said this in my class many times that. Um, I get more from working with young people than I do anything else, to be honest with you. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of success in my life already, you know? And it's not like I, it's not like I didn't aim for it, but I just did it. I worked hard, because my, my feeling is I, I just can outwork anybody. I never felt, and I still don't feel that I'm like the most talented musician or the most talented writer, but there's nobody who can work harder than me. And that, that's one, one thing my mother used to say. She said, well, you know, if they're smarter, you just work harder. You just can't nobody outwork you. So whatever success becomes, you know, comes out of what I do for, out of literature or books or whatever, or music, I really don't pay too much. I always work with, like, just blinders. I don't read reviews. That New York Times review that Dave read, I, I've never read it. And I'm not, not because I'm a snob, I'm delighted that the view, I mean, I'm you know, happy, I don't want to take it back, you know. <laughs> take it back. Take it. No, it's just that you can't work to the satisfaction of other people. You just have to try to live a good life. And then you wake up smiling, you wake up happy. Um, so, you know, I was, I told, this, I, told this to my, I told this to your class, and I told it to every class I, I, I meet at NYU. I said, I always have butterflies in my stomach when I, walking into front of my class for the first time because it's just so nice to see these young people who are, who think you're smart even though you're not, you know. <laughs> and, um, and also it gives me hope to see young people who are, because we have a lot of problems in this country. We have, we really, we do have a whole lot of problems. And I think my generation has done a pretty lousy job setting things up for the next generation. So it gives me hope to see what young people can do. If you're working or writing books or doing anything creative for money, and you're doing it for the money, you're not going to really enjoy yourself, and you're not really going to be successful. I mean, anybody can write. Anybody can write books for money. I mean, all you have to do is just put enough blood and guts in it, and slap one verb together, and just put, you know, put a few. I mean, pulp fiction is easy to do, but what does it mean? I mean, what what are you doing? Are you like, you know? I mean, we used to sing this in church in the sun. Remember, Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. I mean, all these stuff. What happened to all that? You know. Well, that's why I live. I mean, and I, you know, some people don't agree with it, but it's always it's always helped me get out of bed. So the, the, the greatest thing I've ever written is it's probably uh, you know a grade on the the back of your paper that said good job. Now I should say that Melvin is a really good young writer. So <laughs> you know, some of those other kids, man. Oh man, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
All I can say is that uh, I wish I was uh, young enough to be in one of your classes uh, one of these days. Thank you so much for such a wonderful <laughs> evening. Thank you. Very really great. Very really great. And, and, you know, one thing I did forget to say is that whenever uh, September rolls around, it's hard to not think of the Miami Book Fair, which is happening in November, and the Rock Bottom Remainders will be there, and James will show up. Right, James? Yeah, yeah. He will be there as well. So uh, I hope you'll all be with us there as well. And we thank uh, the, the Book Fair for helping to sponsor this evening tonight. We thank you all for coming. And let's give James McBride another big, big round of applause. And now, now, now it's your job is to go up to the front desk, buy a book or three or four or five, and have James sign it. He'll be sitting right here. And when you rise, if you could just fold your chair and just put it against the wall, we'd appreciate it. Thank